Lake Powell has fallen to dangerously low level. It is steadily getting closer to the level where Glen Canyon Dam won't produce power. In the borderlands, where the red cliffs of Arizona relent to Utah's vast high country, a blue shape swells in the desert, a liquid wound stitched by concrete and human will. Lake Powell, reservoir, playground, lifeblood of the West. Created by the great damming of the Colorado, it stretches for nearly 200 miles, filling canyons carved by time. On satellite maps, it glimmers like a blue gem. On summer roads, vacationers pursue its shimmering promise. Yet look closer, the edges are rimmed with chalk white scars, growing year by year as water withdraws and memory is exposed. This is not the lake that once was. In the hush of dawn, what seemed endless, a surface reflecting sandstone spires, lays bare a new reality, channels narrowing, boat docks marooned on dry mud. Now, as June 2025 brings record heat in the west and a forecast grim with drought. What stirs beneath those diminishing waters is worse than any expected ebb. The Colorado, once mighty river of myth, carries only a fraction of its old power. Meanwhile, on screens and notebooks, numbers spiral. 34%, the current fill of the second largest reservoir in the country. Are we witnessing the unraveling of a bargain struck 60 years ago? Water traded for power, wilderness for security? In a summer already marked by oppressive drought and fire risk, what is the meaning, scientific, historical, human, of Powell's slow, relentless retreat? And what true dangers, invisible beneath the surface, gather strength as the lake falls drop by drop? What story does the shrinking heart of the West truly want to tell? Lake Powell in retreat, the anatomy of a crisis. If Lake Powell was born of ambition, of engineers, maps, and the wild dreaming of a nation, it is now beset by arithmetic and limits ever more unforgiving. The lake was created not as an ornament, but as insurance. When Glen Canyon Dam sealed the Colorado in 1963, it built a reservoir meant to guarantee water and power for tens of millions. The logic was simple. Bank floodwaters in wet years. Draw them in dry, smooth out nature's tantrums. Powell would be the balancing pool. Always ready. Always enough. But in 2025, the arithmetic has rebelled. The West confronts an exposure of old promises against the realities of a changing climate, a ledger in which the water owed exceeds the water given. In June's heat, the miracle of the snow-capped Rockies no longer refills the basin as reliably. The annual runoff is nearly halved, and each measurement on the river is a recalculation of risk. Powell, now hovering at only 34% of capacity, is emblematic of more than just shortage. As white bathtub rings expand along its banks, they chronicle both history and warning. Every missing foot exposes not just silt and stone, but the swift erosion of the region margin for error. In the canyons, houseboats clatter against long-abandoned piers. Launch ramps end in cracked clay. For visitors, the receding shoreline is a spectacle, novel, even beautiful in its melancholy. For those who depend on the water, it is a tightening vice. The drought encircles the upper watershed. Western Colorado, stronghold of the river's headwaters, now approaches the summer of 2025, D1 to D3 on drought maps, colored in ochre and red. The river below the Rockies is no longer fed by bounty, but by the remnant trickle of what climate has spared. Each report this June is starker, more ritualistic, runoff low, inflow dwindling, the deficit between promise and reality growing. But what are these numbers, these percentages, if not portents? Is the lake's retreat only a symptom, or is it also a catalyst, a force rewriting the relationships of water, people, and land across the West? What waits beyond the white rings and dwindling edges as Powell recedes into itself? Fault lines, hydropower at risk, and a future unwritten. Beyond the shrinking horizon, Beneath the blue shimmer and open sky lies another infrastructure, a network both visible and invisible, predicated on the presumption of water. Glen Canyon Dam, sentinel at Powell's southern end, is more than concrete and turbines. It is the switchyard of a system woven through homes and cities thousands of miles distant, an artery bringing hydropower to farms in Utah, to light bulbs in Arizona, to air conditioners in Nevada. But even this covenant is fraying. As June heat intensifies and snowmelt fails, risk is mounting. Hydropower, for all its reputation as renewable and perpetual, is ultimately hostage to gravity. 
Turbines spin only while water falls through them. If the reservoir's surface falls below minimum power pool, the dam's engines grow still. The West's second largest reservoir would then be, in utility terms, a stranded asset. For now, in June 2025, official forecasters offer a narrow comfort. Barring extraordinary misfortune, the lake is unlikely to drop low enough to lose hydropower capabilities this summer. The risk is deferred, not erased. The minimum probable forecast, the most pessimistic yet plausible scenario, shows how the boundary is drawn ever closer. A dry summer or a severe heat and wind event could erase the margin overnight. And so, the dam's keepers and the river's watchers scan their instruments with dread as well as hope. Hydropower, once the background hum of stability, faces a basic constraint. With less water, less energy can be made. When the turbines slow, grid managers scramble. Electricity buyers face prices and risks that haven't been seen in a generation. Is this unlikely decline a number on a spreadsheet or a prelude to real material shock? Beneath the political squabbles and legal wrangling, there is a simpler question. What happens when the river that built the modern West can no longer provide the power required to live there? As summer advances, the calculus grows harsher. How much further can Powell fall before its very purpose is lost? The chemistry of collapse when drought becomes disaster. Beneath every dry statistic and dropped foot of water lies a chemistry, a web of reactions that links drought with disaster in ways often hidden. As Powell contracts, each receding line exposes not just rock and silt, but a deeper, invisible crisis brewing below the surface. Even now, in June's oppressive sun, precipitation gauges in the Colorado Highlands record totals far below normal. Their trickle becomes the pulse of a diminished system. As flows shrink, pollutants once diluted become more concentrated. Salinity, long an enemy of Western water users, intensifies in shrinking pools, threatening crops and infrastructure downstream. Harmful algae, bred in stagnant coves and shallow inlets, bloom and spread, fueled by relentless heat and his historic low water levels. Water that was once life-giving becomes, in places, unfit for drinking or irrigation. Elsewhere, as Powell's main stem succumbs to exposure and heat, evaporation works as a silent saboteur. Every square mile lost exposes the remainder to additional loss. Each drop rises to the air never to return, compounding the deficit. Beneath the surface, stratification, layering by temperature and chemistry, begins to break down. The lake churns uneasily, mixing up nutrients and sometimes even ancient pollutants buried beneath layers of sediment. In these emergent shallows, boaters and biologists alike find their way blocked not by distance, but by the unnatural. Woody debris from old floods, twisted detritus of drowned canyons, and, more significantly, the beginnings of collapse among species that once thrived here. As each tributary falters, as the promise of refill fades beneath a hot, dry wind, the question persists. At what point does a drought become something different, irreversible, catastrophic, generational? Is Powell's fate a preview, or is it the result of a process already past the point of easy return? The human bargain, Western water, use unraveled, Yet water does not vanish only to the sky. At the bottom of every deficit is a choice, a pattern of human use, decades old, now running hard against the margins of what climate will allow. Experts' warnings are clear. Western water use is outpacing melting snowpack. In a system where promises were made to more users than there is water to provide, even a single dry year exposes an imbalance too vast to ignore. Consider the map. From Powell's Blue Heart, arteries run in all directions, feeding Phoenix, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, Angeles. The trade was clear. Cities would flourish if the river was captive, its floods banked and budgeted. But as spring's runoff falters, this year, cut nearly in half by the Colorado Basin River Forecast Center, the promise grows brittle. The math is unyielding. Population grows. Agriculture expands. Demand persists. Yet nature delivers ever less. States dispute allocations made nearly a century ago, a time when the basin's average flows were higher and every drop seemed sufficient. Western 
northern Colorado, once the water tower for the region, now faces its own crisis. Rain scarce, drought biting at fields and pastures. Reservoirs on California's side brim with snowmelt, but these are fleeting victories. The main artery, the Colorado, runs weak. Further downstream, towns consider water rationing as riverside farms watch dry cracks spread in their fields, grimly calculating crop by crop what can survive. In community halls and policy rooms, the language grows sharper sacrifice, reallocation, emergency conservation. But the underlying trauma is not only physical, it is a psychic wound, the shattering of shared faith in the river's reliability, the bargain between civilization and the wild. When active management cannot conjure water, what happens then? The answers do not lie in hope, but in adaptation, painful, often unjust, and never complete. Climate's long shadow, the unforgiving pattern. History is written as much in weather as in stone, as much by relentless sun as by sudden storm. If there is a through line to Powell's story in 2025, it is the way climate stakes its claim. Record summer heat is expected. The phrase repeats in drought and fire bulletins. For the Colorado Plateau, for the quilt of deserts, mesas, and river valleys that depend on Powell's stored water, the consequences run deeper than any single gauge or season might suggest. Each spring, water managers once looked to the mountains, the Rockies ghostly white, even as summer deepened, for reassurance. Snowmelt was the insurance, runoff, the dividend. Now, in 2025, this pillar falters, less snow falls, and what arrives vanishes quickly, consumed by warmth, wind, and the parched earth's thirst. Runoff is expected to be cut nearly in half. The predictable cycle now slides into unprecedented territory. Across western Colorado, the basin's cradle, landscapes show pockets of moderate to extreme drought. The green yields to brown, river margins recede. Out on the wider west, fire runs homes, fueled by desiccated grass and new heat records, each blaze further straining already scarce water. Meanwhile, California tells a contradictory story. Snow-laced peaks have filled local reservoirs, offering a temporary relief. But California's own dependence on the Colorado isn't suspended. Its brief reservoir bounty is out of step with Powell's losses, a reminder that the wider system is still in crisis. These threads reveal climate's relentless pressure, a shadow stretching over reservoirs and agreements alike, rewriting hydrology as surely as it transforms orchards and forests. Unusually hot and dry summer, the forecast repeats, and the words land like prophecy. Each inflow, each storm that never arrives, marks not just the present, but a rewrite of the future. Can adaptation keep up with such change? Or is Powell's decline the leading edge of a transformation whose consequences are still unfolding? Revelations in the mud, what the exposed reservoir reveals. Powell's retreat is not only a crisis, it is also an unveiling. As water withdraws, exposing canyon walls and silt flats unseen for generations, a strange archaeology emerges. Each foot lost draws the line deeper into the past. Marinas gone dry, carved alcoves now accessible by foot, long-forgotten canyons newly revealed. There is beauty, even awe, in these discoveries. Towering arches unveiled, old footprints pressed into the mud, echoes from the river's wild years before the dam. For those who remember the pre dam Glen Canyon. These are both wounds and glimpses of lost wonder, a drowned world reluctantly returned. But the exposure is not only romantic, it is also a reckoning with what lies hidden. Infrastructure never meant for exposure, contaminants locked away beneath silt now at risk of release, invasive species able to colonize new shallows. As evaporation accelerates and water levels drop, houseboats are stranded, docks creak on drying soil, marinas fall far from the receding waterline. These logistical consequences ripple outward, tourism slows, jobs are lost, local economies once buoyed by recreation, feel the slow, irrefutable drag of attrition. And all the while, the ecological system stirs uneasily. Native species, already embattled, forced to migrate or perish as their habitat shrinks and warms. Experts and locals alike note the paradox. The more the lake withdraws, the more of the old river is revealed, and the more we must face the debts left by decades of hope and engineering. Does the resurrection of lost canyons merely invite nostalgia, or does it demand a new sense of balance? River, reservoir, desert, city, 
for is the reckoning still unfinished, embedded in layers of mud, yet exposed by retreating waves. Systemic unraveling, the network beyond the lake. As June's heat rolls on, it becomes ever clearer. Powell's crisis does not end at Glen Canyon's shadow. It radiates outward through power lines, pipelines, aqueducts, and government chambers. Lake Powell's stability, long taken for granted, underpins not only local communities, but a complex, interlocking web, urban water supply, rural farming, fire suppression, energy delivery, and even international agreements. Hydropower, already at risk, supports vast stretches of the southwest's grid. Water allocations, set long ago, now require delicate and sometimes desperate adjustment as shortages bite harder. Farmers, relying on Lake Powell's reserves, now confront a harsh reckoning, cut crops, abandoned orchards, and uncertain livelihoods. Each diminished output, each reduced megawatt or acre foot, becomes a policy trigger, calls for mandatory restrictions, allocation rollbacks, emergency compacts, or even lawsuits. Cities proud of conservation must recalculate the limits of further savings. California's recent abundance, rooted in its own snowmelt, is an exception, a flicker of old security amid deepening uncertainty. Meanwhile, the cultural impacts are profound. As marinas empty and boat ramps become relics, local economies struggle to adjust. Generational ties to Powell, birthdays at the lake, houseboat summers, family holidays are interrupted by closures and warnings of low water or poor quality. Yet the individual stories pale beside the systemic realization. Powell's shrinkage is not a solitary event, but a symptom of a system moving out of balance. Water managers, utilities, politicians, and citizens alike face a crisis of confidence. The question persists, if not this lake, then which one? If not now, then when? Is there a line, ecological, economic, political, that once crossed cannot be redrawn? In the shadows of what remains, Lake Powell, once conceived as a guarantee, is now the stage for a confrontation between nature's extremes and human appetite, between past planning and present emergency, between the memory of abundance and the reality of encroaching scarcity. This June, beneath the drumbeat of drought and heat, each drop lost is a line added to the new history of the American West. The bathtub rings glow ghostly in the fading light, silent witnesses to what is past and what may never return. Yet the voices along the canyon, scientists, old timers, river runners, ranchers, newcomers, refuse both resignation and empty reassurance. Instead, there is a sharpening vigilance. Every measurement matters. Every shift in the weather is parsed for omens of relief or disaster. Western water use, forecast, and crisis alike is laid bare for all to see. The consequences extend to cities once thought immune, to landscapes scarred by fire, to economies forced to reckon with new limits. In this, the greatest lesson may not be hidden beneath shrinking waves, but spelled out on the visible face of the problem itself. The story of Powell in 2025 is not of a single dry year, nor a solitary lake battered by fate. It is the story of a civilization meeting its own reflection in receding shorelines, parched fields, and an uneasy recalibration of our relationship with a natural order we cannot fully command. What does it mean, then, to watch a reservoir vanish, to measure each new low and wonder, quietly, what comes after storage, after power, after the certainty that water would always be there when asked? Perhaps in the end, Powell's retreat is neither pure tragedy nor mere lesson, but a reckoning, a moment when the arc of the West bends back upon itself, demanding not just reaction, but reconsideration, not with finality, not with despair, but with the humility that comes when the land redraws the lines of possibility. If you've watched Powell's old edges exposed, felt the chill of water where none flows now, or wondered what it means for a great lake to falter, this story is yours too. Like and subscribe if you want to follow the next lines of the West's unfolding water story. And in the comments, tell us, is the lake's greatest secret what it hides or what it reveals when the waves yield to desert once again? Thank you for watching. And remember, even as the lake recedes, its story deepens. Stay curious, stay vigilant. The crisis beneath Lake Powell is not only a chapter of drought, but a question for the future. Will we answer in time?